Uh, hi, everybody. My name is David Churchwell. I'm a second year law student here at the University of Colorado Law School. The next panel for today is uh, the regulation of lies, misinformation, and deep fakes. I think this is a really interesting and important topic, particularly today. It's going to you know, be influenced on matters of just general trust in information systems, election security, and especially of importance, definitely Taylor Swift. So I am going to now introduce our moderator for today. It's Professor Blake Reed. He is an associate professor here at the University of Colorado Law School and is also the director of the Telecom and Platforms Initiative at Silicon Flatirons. So I'll leave it to Blake Reed to introduce the remainder of the panel. Thanks so much, uh, David. Have to shout David out, who is a, a star student. David, do you have a job this uh, this upcoming summer? I don't. I, I, I'm very excited to say this about all our students, but I really, really mean it about David. David is a star. Hire him at your firm. Uh, if you are not doing it, you are losing out. Um, Just to plug you a little bit more, yeah, David. From two separate. Yeah, you know. I, we, we know. All right, let's get to business here. All right, we're going to talk about deep fake misinformation and lies. And you got to indulge me for just a second to orient you to some truth, which is the CU women's basketball team is on fire. Number six in the country, big win over the University of Washington yesterday. Jalen Sherrod, Frida Foreman, they call her Frida because she can hit those threes. Uh, Aaronette Vonley in the paint, they are all stellar student athletes, several of them grad students. They do CR, see you proud with their coach, J.R. Payne. Big flat iron shout out to them. And we have got our own uh, dream team here on stage today. Uh, at point guard, uh, Danielle uh, Citrone, who is a professor of law at the University of Virginia School of Law. She's going to start us off uh, with a presentation on gendered and sexualized deep fakes and disinformation. Um, then uh, on the screen uh, from the UK, I'm not sure if there's basketball Basketball there, so maybe uh, maybe the Lionel Messi of the group, maybe the Ted Lasso. Uh, I'm out of soccer nice. material. Uh, Jessica Zucker, who is the director of online uh, safety policy at Ofcom, um, she will give a whistle stop tour of the Online Safety Act. Um, and then we've got a Hall of Famer on stage. Former FCC Commissioner Susan Ness is a distinguished fellow uh, at the Annenberg Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Will brief us uh, on disinformation efforts in the EU. Hometown hero, David Sullivan, uh, the executive director of the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership is gonna lead our conversation uh, on public-private partnerships. And then someone from an okay basketball town, uh, Matt Peral, the director of the Center on uh, Technology Policy at UNC Chapel Hill. I, I, I don't know, I meant to look that up. Uh, we'll close us out uh, with a little bit of uh, cold water on uh, job owning and the First Amendment. Let's tip it off with Danielle. I love that. There's no one better to introduce anything right than Blake. Uh, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, I, I feel like if, if you ask me about what symphony or part of a symphony I am, I'm always so depressing. So maybe it's like Holtz, you know, the planet's bringer of war, maybe where I'm at today. <laughs> Though I could, <laughs> in the moment, that was fabulous. That Thank you for that conversation before. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, synthetic media, and in particular, of course, as we call it, deep fakery, which um, having started writing about it in 2017 with Bobby Chesney, um, I, I can say that the phenomenon that we worried about back then as Mr. Deepfake, sort of Reddit, subreddit user who was like programmer by day, um, deepfake new, you know, sex video creator by night, um, when, what we imagined and what we, as together, he's a national security person, I'm, I'm privacy and an intimate privacy and cyber stalking person. Um, and we wrote about the challenges, of course, to democracy, to speech, to national security, diplomacy, privacy. And, and as we talked about then, and, and we've seen it come to fruition, women are always the canaries in the coal mine. Um, you know, in 2019, and I had, we had seen this already happening and a lot of the worries that we had about the ways in which deep fakes were gonna sort of undermine an election, you know, tip an election the night before, the deep fake wall time deep fake. We worried about the night before an IPO, you know, the deep fake wall time to crater the stock. We worried about all those things. But what we knew then and now what we see in exponentially large numbers is that uh, synthetic media, deep fake sex videos, in 2019 there were 
an estimate of 14,000 uh, posted online, 14,000 deep fakes posted online, and 90% of them were deep fake sex videos, and 98% of them were of women's faces, of course, morphed into porn. Now that number has grown and exponentially, and the story has not moved at all. all right, the, the, the large number, not only of like telegram channels with 650,000 deep fake sex videos of women being traded, you know, there is just, it's the ease at which we can now make deep fake sex videos, whereas when I first started writing about it, 2017, 18, you needed a lot of images, right? So now with one image and now text, you can say, do this with this image. It is so democratized. It is so easy to create a deep fake sex video with someone you care about and know and like Taylor Swift, someone you don't know. Now the first, you know, Mr. Deepfake, I should not give any promotion to these despicable site operators, but there are sites that are, of course, in this business. Um, and Taylor Swift, there have been deepfake sex videos of Taylor Swift. And I, we are in an interesting moment where the viral spread, given her beloved status and popularity, um, you know, people sort of were actively involved in getting it taken down. And I think we're in an important moment Though when people call me, I'm like, I've been batting on about this stuff for so long. Like, we're paying attention, thank you, goodness. But, you know, where we've been, um, I'm grateful for, for that we're paying attention, of course, to Taylor Swift. But it has everything to do, I know so, some of the theme of our panel is elections, right? It has everything to do with democracy, the fact that women's faces are being morphed into porn. And I'm going to give you, I always do like, just give you some examples so we can get a sense of the visceral impact that deepfake sex imagery has on people's lives. So in 2000, 2018, Rana Ayub, incredible investigative journalist in India, um, she got a like a ping on her phone that said, a source from the Modi regime said like, check your phone basically, check your Twitter account. And she had the temerity the night before to go on BBC America to critique the Modi regime for its human rights abuses of the Muslim community. And what then she saw on her phone, like seconds later, was like ping, 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 right? Her Twitter then is blowing up and it's a deep fake sex clip of her that then within 48 hours made its way onto half the phones in India. Um, death and rape threats, you know, like doxing um, her, you know, she basically went underground. She was in ads impersonating her that she was available for sex in her home address. And she basically hid in her home for six months and she didn't, she stopped writing. And that was certainly the goal of the Modi regime. What do they say? Check, right? Accomplished. Um, same is true. I think let's just go over to the United States. Nina Jankowicz was named the head of Biden's DHS's newly created disinformation governance board, which was gonna continue the work that DHS and Department of State have been doing, but amplifying trusted voices, right? And within, a, within two days, um, she was enemy number one on, on Fox News. Sean Hannity's show had Lauren Boebert. Um, they accused her of wanting to be a censor in chief. And what then followed was the kind of cyber stalking that Rana faced, um, including of course, deep fake porn. And as a disinformation expert, you know, Nina and, you know, explained to me, of course she saw this coming, you know, the doxing, the rape and death threats, the saying you can't leave your house even to walk your dog, you have to move, she was eight months pregnant. Um, but it was so depressing, right? It, anticipating, of course, disinformation to silence you. She had written a book called How to Be a Woman Online about gendered abuse, right? Like, of course, this was the playbook to silence her. And it worked, right? Biden administration kind of backs off, closes up shop. They say, you can stay on, but she's like, doing what? Um, it, it's a regrettable, but yet long time story, right? Of how we can use intimate images to silence you know, women who are making great contributions to democracy, whether it's journalists or it's government and you know, actors. Um, and of course, the Vice President Harris, when, when 2016 and 2020 imagery that was faked and, and morphed in, with sexual imagery and sexual messages, of course, were all over the internet. Um, and of course, then tinged with racism as well. 
Right. Um, so uh, I, I have a lot to say, of course, in my work about what we ought to do about it. Um, there are proposals, of course, in Congress, very weak proposals to address with civil penalties. The perpetrators, the creators, think we ought to focus, I hope, our discussion on the intermediaries, the companies making money, right? The site operators making money, monetizing ad companies, um, facilitating this, and thanks to Section 230, which I'm really looking forward to talking about, um, has provided a broad scale immunity. Um, it is not only like the incentives, of course, are there to keep this up. It is, and it's it's almost irresponsible for shareholders' perspective if you don't, uh, in some respects. So we've got to change that law. Um, and uh, I think I'll, s I was supposed to do five minutes. I might have gone over. No, you got seven. I got yeah, seven. Yeah, How am going. I doing? Like, I'm looking at it, it looks like eight, but whatever. Okay. Yeah, if, if you got a, clo a closing. Call, I got, okay, my close <laughs> um, is no, I'm really looking forward to the conversation about the role of intermediaries, the role of, of course, law vis a vis individuals. Um, often, the, the and, and E.G. Wonderful Wiser brought up yesterday, the, as did Alan, um, our you know, assistant secretary, the notion of this sort of resilient subject that is. The idea that we as individuals have some role in it, and, and it's like absurd to so suggest in this area. But I look forward to, to having really enriching conversations with you, all of you. Well, thanks for the wonderful start, Danielle. So I want to open it up to our panel for reactions. Let's keep it to about a minute on this topic. Then we'll uh, key into uh, Jessica's uh, presentation and then open it up more broadly from there. If I could, um, let's go down the row. We'll start with Susan, David, Matt, and then we'll go uh, up to Jessica on the screen. Susan. Danielle, first of all, you are spot on in your concerns, uh, spot on in bringing forth the issue, which is so critical. And it is uh, certainly in the political realm. Uh, exponentially, women are no longer interested uh, in having blogs and commenting because they get attacked. Uh, in, as I'm sure we'll hear in the UK and in Europe, uh, the attacks on women politicians have been unbelievable, uh, as they are here as well. So um, I, uh, I'm thrilled that you are here and that we're having this conversation. Moving on to David. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I think um, Harry uh, certain had um, some uh, important points about how bad we are at anticipating what the harms from new technologies are. And the exception to that is Danielle, um, who has been right on uh, that I think for all of the concerns um, about what sort of societal or systemic risks may be arising from uh, disinformation and how it's pr pr you know propagated through technology, um, this is really just going back to the, the playbook that started with Gamergate, if not before that, that the, the real threat to democracy here is driving women and other marginalized communities out of public life, off the platforms and the tools that they need to be effective um, as, you know, in, uh, in democracy. And, uh, and it's something we got to do something about. Uh, what a privilege to be on this panel and have a chance to respond um, to all the various different experts uh, that we have here. Um, I share the concerns about the horrors of this issue. I have experienced them in ex an extremely small percentage relative to some of the people who have really um, borne the brunt of this kind of abuse. And in each time, I have found it to be sort of harrowing and hurtful. And again, that's an extreme, I think I've gotten extremely mild forms of it. And so um, I certainly uh, have a sense, even if from afar, of how, how horrible this issue is. The solution side, I think, is really complicated, and I'm not sure on this issue, as with so many others, how to find solutions that match and address the horrors of the problem without creating their own sets of challenges. David and I actually were, comp were talking yesterday about age verification and how clearly on the issue of harm to kids, there's just a universal sense, I think for good reason, that there's a need to do something on this issue, and yet with that one, the starting point is, well, who's a kid? And that is just an incredibly challenging and fraught question to figure out from a policy standpoint. I think the same thing is true here. Um, I understand the concerns about laws like Section 230, but I think a lot of the reforms to those laws would create problems. We've seen that in existing reform 
um, efforts to date, and I think it, it tends to be an issue where um, there's a lot of, th there are challenges in the solution. So I'm curious about the range of possibilities that we might consider if we're interested in tackling the issue seriously and hopefully mitigating costs along the way. Jessica, wanna bring you into the conversation. And if I could ask you a quick uh, reaction to, uh, to Danielle, and then I, I wanna ask Danielle one more question, then we'll go to your presentation, Chief. Absolutely. Um, can I make sure that everyone can hear me okay over there? We gotcha. Great. Um, thank you, Danielle, for such an important presentation for raising such really, really difficult and complicated issues and to the, to the panelists for all of their remarks. I think without a doubt, the spread of this kind of material is deeply, deeply disturbing and can cause truly untold harm. Um, the, the new laws in the UK, which I'll speak about in a little bit, are really clear that tech firms are gonna have to do a lot more to tackle intimate image abuse, and, and especially when it comes to that intersection with uh, deep fake and AI generated technology. What that means in practice, and again, I'll, I'll speak in more depth about this in a minute, is one, um, the, the platforms themselves will have to be assessing the risk of this kind of illegal material um, and take steps to reduce the risk of that happening in the first place. Secondly, they'll be required to act quickly to remove these kinds of posts when they become aware of them. And then thirdly, they'll have to be res responding really consistently with their terms of service, especially in the cases of the largest platforms. We're on track to bring in these duties later on this year and they will be in force at that point. And at that point, we will really be expecting tech platforms to be fully prepared to comply with them when we, when we do have that power. Um, they also have the opportunity to work with us now, but if they don't, we have a really broad range of enforcement powers at our disposal that we're ready to use to ensure accountability in the space. But just overarching reflection is we really echo and hear your concerns and agree. Well, thanks so much, Jessica. And I know the next part of our conversation is going to turn to solutions. But Danielle, before uh, we, we leave your excellent presentation for a moment, I wanted to ask about the other theme I, I heard from the, the panel, which is you have been predicting this for a long time. I remember reading Cyber Civil Rights in Paul Ohm's seminar when I was a law student here in 2008 and thinking, oh my God, this is happening on the internet. It was something that changed sort of what I thought about the internet, but it, that was almost 16 years ago now. What are your reflections? That's what we're saying. <laughs> that, I'm good with that. Not, totally. I'm alive. I'm breathing at 65. I'm so happy. Okay. Right? Like, <laughs> not the intended subject. I love um, you. <laughs> so, so I guess the question is, um, having predicted these things for so long, it's sort of horrifying to me that we have gotten 16 years on from, yeah. from the early stages of your work um, and are, are here today. What are your reflections on that? How, how yeah. has that? How, how oh, that no. And out? I was teasing. I love Blake, just so you know. I'm so grateful that you're my colleague. So, um, you know, in writing about, you know, my first book was about cyber stalking and thinking about the ways in which, of course, network tools were being weaponized against women and sexual and gender minorities and non whites. Um, and the problem has only, unfortunately, escalated. And what has really frustrated me, we had this like moment in time. So I worked with, our then California Attorney General Kamala Harris. Um, I took a sabbatical to work for her in 2015 um, on what she called cyber exploitation, but it was intimate image you know, abuse issues. And we had this moment where there was so much change sort of afoot, culturally, socially, uh, working with companies as we do with the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. Marianne uh, Franks and I felt like, golly, okay, well, foothold, changing the laws around the country around non-consensual intimate imagery, going from two to 48 DC, Puerto Rico and Guam as it stands now. Like we had this moment where, you know, change was like, it was so gratifying. And then we've seen sort of a massive backlash and um, the, the kind of continued invisibility of cyber gender abuse. You know, my last book was about intimate privacy. And you know, the, the way in which we, of course, I think intuitively all appreciate how viscerally important the privacy of our bodies and our health and our thoughts and our relationships and our sexual activities are. Like fundamentally, I think at a gut level, we all want, we all deserve, we all expect it. And it has been so deflating in some sense, like listening to our glorious AG, Colorado AG Phil Weiser, you know, in his oral argument at Counterman versus Colorado, 
a case about cyber stalking in which, you know, a the the victim had received hundreds upon hundreds of unwanted texts um, from a delusional stalker who made it seem like they were in a relationship and also suggested he was seeing her physically and watching her because he was saying, I saw your moms, I saw your, you know, you in your white Jeep, I, you know, and then it got quite threatening when she refused to write back. And Phil in making the oral argument um, was trying to explain the breadth of how it's like slow motion murder and terrifying. This woman gave up her job as a musician. She moved across the country. Um, and the justices, so this you like my reflections, this is my little bit of my sadness here, right? So trivialized what was going on, there was laughter in the audience, like, as Justice Roberts would take text for text. So not viewing this as hundreds of texts, as A.G. Weiser made beautifully clear, it was hundreds and hundreds, almost 10 every day, from someone who clearly knew where she was and was watching her, Cole, Cole's Whelan. And Justice Roberts took a text like in out of context and was like, what is this about? This says, you know, you're better off in cyber life, out of cyber life. Like, I might say that, the audience, ha, 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 right? Justice Gorsuch, similarly, like bringing up a singular text, you can't understand stalking without the full breadth of the abuse, having been writing about it since 2000, and I guess, seven and eight, right? And it just felt, first of all, they got the case wrong. You know, it's not, a, it wasn't a true threats case. They increased the standards under the First Amendment for how you have to show true threats. So depressing result, but I think for me, even more depressing, was their behavior and what it said to, to victims of cyber stalking. Like, you ain't no big deal. And the whole, you know, yesterday, I forgot who said this, but like, close the internet, you know, close your computer, boys will be boys, or like, you can go away from cyber life is precisely to this day what law enforcement, state, local, federal, state of victims, right? They say, ah, just ignore it, it'll go away, it'll drop down in search results, like, no one's paying attention. So I guess this is to say that those views that we thought we had moved beyond, right? Like here we are, right, 16, 18 years later, and we haven't. So I don't, I am kind of a doggy downer today. It's true, I kind of always am, you know, I don't mean to, but at the same time, I'm a little bit of a Pollyanna, I always am, because I do see rewarding change. So that's like, I hate to say it, but it was meaningful for me to be here, of course, yesterday with the AG, Wiser, because he did such an incredible job. And, you know, I'm so proud to be his friend and so appreciate the work and appreciate, of course, the work that all of you do. But it, it did seem like, a, man, we have not come that far. Well, and you uh, alluded to A.G. Weiser's remark about uh, a David Pogue piece in 2000 where he says at the end of it, if you're really so concerned about these problems with the internet, shut the modem off. That was 24. Four totally. years ago that that was written, and here you have the Supreme Court spouting a line that seemed ridiculous to anybody that was paying attention to it 24 years ago. Okay, now we Sorry get to, that. Yeah, we, we do know. though get to go to a more uplifting note, which is uh, uh, our friends uh, across the pond have actually uh, started uh, doing some work that we have been unable uh, to do in, in this country. Jessica, I'm delighted uh, to, to welcome you um, for, uh, as you put it, a, a whistle stop tour through what's going on in the United Kingdom. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, um, Blake. Thank you and, and to the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you all today while I'm over here in London. Um, I'm Jessica Zucker. I'm a director on uh, Ofcom's online safety group. I'm also a trust and safety expert and have worked at some of the biggest tech platforms over the last 10 years, including at Meta and at Microsoft. And this really informs uh, how I show up to my, my job and the experience that I bring to the, to the regulatory work. Um, I'm here today to talk to you guys about how the UK is implementing online safety regulation in practice, um, how we're planning to use these new laws to tackle some of these really important issues around mis- and disinformation, and what we've learned so far from uh, the past few years in our prepar preparatory work. Um, so first, I'm going to stop. I'm going to start with Ofcom. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with us. We are the UK's communications regulator. We are independent from government, which is sort of a unique construct uh, in the UK. We are also a converged regulator, which means that we have over two decades of experience in regulating other communication sectors, such as telecoms and broadcast. And this really informs the work that we do. 
Um, we've been slowly uh, and quickly uh, building up a team of 350 people within Ofcom who are all uh, working together to implement these new laws, which is pretty astounding, the amount of resources that we, we have at our disposal. So what we've been doing with that is uh, been compiling teams of people from really diverse backgrounds. So you have people like me who come from the tech sector, but we also have economists, we have regulatory experts, uh, public policy specialists, uh, technologists, and online safety experts. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll switch over to uh, sharing a little bit more about these new laws. Um, so some of you may have been following this, uh, but the Online Safety Act passed in October 2023, just a few months ago, and at the very highest level, it requires tech platforms to put in place uh, the right systems and processes to keep their users safe. And as the regulator, we are tasked with implementing this Online Safety Act. And our overarching objective really is to make the UK a safer place online. It's the, the mission at the simplest terms. This is really our guiding light because the act is extremely complex. It is novel. It covers a huge range of harms and it's estimated to put in place uh, about 100,000 plus companies in scope. And many of these companies are not headquartered in the UK. So it is a uh, truly vast and uh, all encompassing role. And it has a number of different act critical activities that we need to be thinking about in order to do this job well. Um, so what we're doing is kind of sequencing our, our work. We're first starting with um, tackling illegal content. So we've recently published a consultation that is a whopping 1700 pages of uh, <laughs> codes of practices and proposed mitigations for how to how tech platforms can deal with some of these kinds of uh, content issues that are illegal in the UK. So this includes things like uh, terrorism, illegal hate speech, inciting violence, uh, child sexual abuse material, um, not a conclusive list, but just uh, some examples. Um, this is our first priority and where we started first. Um, next, we are, are gonna be focusing on our proposals for how tech firms can protect children from harmful content. And then finally, we'll be working on implementing a set of additional duties that will apply to a subset of the 100,000 companies in scope of this regulation, what we refer to as categorized firms. It's not exactly the same as the DSA's designation of uh, very large online platforms or VLOPs, but similar in concept. Um, to be really clear, what the Online Safety Act does not do is uh, require Ofcom to be instructing tech companies to remove individ individual pieces of content or to investigate inv individual complaints. Um, rather, the aim of the Online Safety Act is to tackle online harms at scale, so seeking improvements at a more systemic level. And we think that that can really help reduce risk across the spectrum rather than focusing on sort of individual instances of harm. Um, so with that kind of framing, um, I thought I'd deep dive a little bit into the topic of today, which is mis and disinformation. And I also wanted to, to add in a bit of our uh, perspective on the importance of free expression, free speech. Um, I think all of us here today uh, uh, know that the manipulation of information is not a new phenomenon, but the way that it can spread and the scale and the harm that it can cause online truly is unprecedented. I used to lead the team at Meta dealing with misinformation in the Europe, Middle East and Africa, and I, I know this firsthand that it is an incredibly complicated and difficult area. We're seeing platforms today, just as I did when I was uh, in the tech industry, facing a huge number of challenges in how to tackle these issues. Um, Fortunately, um, as Blake said, I'm, I'm here to give a slightly more uplifting uh, overview. Um, and the good news is that the Online Safety Act does empower Ofcom to hold platforms to account in preventing the spread of mis and disinformation in certain cases. So the first uh, big area where we're focusing on now is that all platforms will be required to prevent foreign interference activities. So this might include state-sponsored disinformation campaigns that are specifically targeting uh, the UK. Secondly, for um, a subset of platforms that are categorized, like I mentioned earlier, they'll be subject to these additional online safety duties. And where it cuts into mis- and disinformation is that they will be required to ensure that they are applying their own terms of service consistently and effectively. And many of the platforms today already do prohibit many forms of misinformation. And Ofcom's job will be to uh, hold those platforms to account in um, enforcing their own rules. And then the third area, and personally where I'm most excited about is transparency. So all of these categorized firms um, will be subject to additional transparency requirements. And while we're still in very early days uh, about thinking about what our transparency regime will look like and what we want to focus on, 
um, we really see that this is one of the most fundamental regulatory tools that we can have uh, that will shed a light on how platforms are tackling mis and disinformation. Um, so that's what Ofcom will be doing and empowered to, to be doing it with regards to the tech platforms, but we're also taking a number of actions internally as well. Um, we're taking proactive steps to make sure that we are prepared and we understand fully these areas, which is why as part of the implementation of the Online Safety Act, we are establishing uh, an advisory committee on mis and disinformation that will be helping inform um, a breadth of issues across um, how we enforce these rules, our transparency regime, as well as our media literacy requirements. Um, now I wanted to switch slightly to talk about the importance of free speech because you can't talk about online safety without talking about the other side of this. And this is something that we really care deeply about in the UK. Um, so when it comes to freedom of expression or free speech, all services um, in scope of the Online Safety Act have a duty to take into account the importance of protecting users' right to uh, express themselves. And additionally, when it comes to these categorized firms that have these additional duties, they'll have to put in place a number of uh, additional requirements to ensure that they are not unduly infringing on these rights. So a couple of these things include um, carrying out and publishing impact assessments of their policies and safety measures on free expression, uh, protecting news publisher content and ensuring that they notify news publishers before taking down or restricting their content, as well as protecting journalist content and content of democratic importance in the UK. So a lot of really meaty and difficult issues that we're gonna be um, focused on developing our policy areas in the coming years. Um, and finally, when it comes to online safety, freedom of expression and mis and disinformation, um, media literacy is so incredibly important. This is uh, another area where we are, have a, a lot of existing powers already and plan on using that in tandem with our new powers under the Online Safety Act. Really at the heart of this, uh, the promotion of good trusted information and giving users more access to tools to empower their own online experiences is absolutely central to this mission of creating a safer life for people online in the UK. Um, so that's sort of the, the top line on, on the Online Safety Act and how it relates to mis and disinformation. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes sharing a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned and how we've been preparing over the, the last few years and the perspective that we'll be bringing as we look into the first few years of this online safety regime. It's an enormous and incredibly humbling opportunity to have this responsibility, and it's not something that we take lightly, which is why we've been spending so much time ensuring that we've built up the right team and we have the right expertise within Ofcom to do this. Um, but we're also not starting from scratch here. So since 2021, we've been regulating around 20 video sharing platforms that are established in the UK. Um, some that you may know are TikTok, Snap, OnlyFans, and Twitch, as well as a number of other smaller platforms. And this regime, the video sharing platform regime or VSP is, is similar to the Online Safety, Safety Act. It's similar to the DSA in that it's focusing on um, the platforms having the right systems and processes rather than um, uh, taking down in individual pieces of content. Um, but there are certain differences in terms of the powers that we have, the scope of the, the regime and the types of content that are in scope. Nevertheless, um, we've taken a lot of lessons from this and uh, I thought I'd share a few. Um, so the first kind of key thing that we've learned from our, our work regulating so far is the importance of building uh, relationships with the platforms through what we call at Ofcom our supervisory function. Um, so supervision, as, as we know it, is uh, it basically involves building productive relationships with platforms through regular and formal engagement. We use our supervision team and, and these relationships that we have to learn informally about safety measures and things that are happening on the platform it's really for us to sort of preempt risks uh, to users and to push improvements for safety um, through our informal soft powers and our relationships. And this is always paired with, you know, our, our formal regulatory tools, our enforcement functions, our information gathering functions. But we think that this is a really helpful way to sort of build uh, informal relationships. And we have seen change happen. For example, we worked with OnlyFans to secure changes to its reporting function for child sexual abuse. Um, so that more serious harms could be prioritized quickly. And this was done via our supervisory relationships rather than using our formal enforcement powers. So we have seen that this can really work in practice, though it is an important journey that we take platforms on so that they understand um, the, the purpose and the function of those co uh, conversations. Um, the second thing that I think has come out really clearly for us in our years of regulating so far is that um, a lot of the biggest platforms in particular have a huge range of uh, safety measures in place. 
at some times it can be sort of overwhelming the number of policies and products and operations and features that are being introduced. And these are great initial developments, but we need to be able to make sense of it. And that's why it's not just on Ofcom's responsibility, but also on the tech firms themselves to be asking themselves, are these uh, safety measure measures having any impact? Are they being effective in practice? And that's really where we are laser focused right now is understanding the efficacy of those safety, safety measures and where they're not effective, we'll be pushing for improvements. And then the last thing, and I, I'm sure this will resonate to what I assume is a mostly US audience right now is uh, how much we've recognized the importance of collaborating both um, with uh, domestic reg regulators in the UK, but also internationally. Um, legislative and regulatory developments in the US, the EU, as well as around the world, really do affect us in the UK and the companies that we regulate. And so we want to be very sure that we are coordinating as effectively as we can. Um, this is why we've set up um, a global online safety regulator network, which today consists of a number of regulators from Australia, Ireland, Fiji, France, South Africa, and South Korea. And our goal here is to harmonize our approach to online safety regulation where we can. Um, so I will stop there. And I just want to again, thank the organizers for the opportunity to join from London. Um, we have a very long road ahead of us, but we at Ofcom as well as I, I think everyone here on the panel, as well as the room, really share this goal of, of trying to make people safer online. Um, I look forward to the discussion and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Jessica. That was terrific. And I, I think you have nicely teed up the rest of the themes that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to call a little bit of an audible here. Susan, I wonder if I can start with you to draw a comparison to sure. the EU experience. Then David, I'm going to come to you to talk about the public-private partnership dimensions. And then Matt, I'm going to come to you to tell us why none of this is going to work in the United States, I assume. <laughs> um, and then Danielle, we'll loop back for, for your reactions. We'll go from there. Susan, okay. start First with you. of all, I, I want to um, underscore the value of the approach that Ofcom has taken. It, it has hired out 350 staffers uh, who come from a variety of experiences, including who have worked at companies. Too often regulators um, or, or even nonprofits are afraid to hire anyone who has actually worked for a company because they're tainted. That's not the case, and they come with valuable experience. Secondly, uh, the uh, concept of supervisory function learning, working with the platforms to get them where they need to be, I think is very, very helpful, as opposed to having a hammer and having a, um, a really um, uh, a discordant relationship with uh, the companies that you're regulating. I think that can be extremely helpful. Uh, hopefully that will be demonstrated in the quality of the impact. Um, and then also um, wanted to note um, the, um, the formation of that global uh, online safety regulators network hugely helpful to get common ideas, figure out what's working, what's not working. I look forward um, on my modularity project to be working with them and um, have had a lot of uh, good comments and support from Ofcom. That, all of that said, I'm hoping that Ofcom is going to be uh, expanding its authority uh, through legislation to do the researcher access. I know that's something uh, that's been discussed. Um, this is something that the European uh, Digital Services Act has uh, to help um, the uh, commission determine what's happening out there and that valuable data that the companies have to um, be able to determine whether or not they're actually fulfilling their obligations. And I'm hoping that we'll have a similar thing from uh, the UK. Uh, generally, disinformation should not be confused with foreign influence operations. I just wanted to, to draw that distinction by state or non-state actors. They're treated differently. Uh, in most places, there's no freedom of expression or First Amendment concerns on that type of uh, activity. Democracies, however, with general disinformation, have a very difficult time with government curbing disinformation. Protection of society clashes with fundamental freedom of expression. 
Um, in the European Union, the issue, uh, the issue was initially addressed by Commissioner Jourova, uh, who was in DG Justice and, and not the Internal Market or DG Connect, which um, has been responsible for most of the regulations, including the DSA. Um, this is especially sensitive in countries that had been previously under um, the um, uh, communist rule. They don't want to have a ministry of truth. And so just like uh, Ofcom and, and the Online Safety Act, the EU's digital uh, DSA, Digital Services Act, um, does not prohibit specific pieces of content Rather, it goes towards um, uh, the um, uh, risk assessment and um, uh, off, um, um, and an accountability regime to be able to address those things. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Commission created a voluntary code of practice, working with the largest platforms digital advertising ecosystem companies, NGOs, including defenders of freedom of expression, fact checkers. Each entity had to make specific commitments, voluntary commitments, um, based on the nature of their organization with frequent public reporting on their outcomes. Each month, uh, the commission ratcheted up the pressure to do more prior to the 2019 parliamentary elections. It was part of an EU democracy action plan, which included citizen education, strengthening European foreign services ability to tackle foreign information manipulation and, and interference, all while trying to protect freedom of expression. In 2022, the commission launched a strengthened code of practice with 34 signatories, 44 commitments and 128 specific measures, including uh, demonetization of bad actors, transparency of political advertising, uh, reducing manipulative behavior, that's, those are um, cutting back on uh, FANC accounts, bot-driven amplification and the like, enhancing tools for users to be able to recognize and flag disinformation, encouraging media literacy and the like. Also, the empowering researchers that I just talked about. Um, empowering the fact-checking community, vitally important. And it's set up, as you have, a task force to monitor changes in the marketplace. The commission did not define disinformation or require specific takedown, again, instead, based on transparency and accountability. Two rounds of reports, most signatories, uh, according to these reports, still do not adequately measure, as you were saying, the impact their efforts are having on behaviors. Under the DSA, the code of practice will become mandatory or has to become mandatory for very large platforms. Their performance will be evaluated as part of their self-risk assessment and their mitigation efforts. Separately, a political agreement between the parliament and the council has been reached on regulating political ads, uh, creating, uh, requiring labeling, creating a searchable database, prohibiting targeted advertising based on specific categories, and if it becomes final, uh, it would not come into force until 2025 after the European elections in June. Um, if I still have another couple of moments, speaking of elections, 2024, as you have probably heard before, is the biggest election year in the world history. Countries making up more than half of the world's population will hold elections, including the European Union, US, India, Russia, uh, and uh, probably the United Kingdom, although that may pass into 2025. Everywhere there's concern about defakes, misinformation interfering with elections. Last summer, the uh, Federal Election Commission began a process to potentially regulate AI-generated deepfakes and political ads ahead of the 2024 election. No action yet. In the meantime, 14 states uh, have introduced legislation to address disinformation for the upcoming elections. Um, so that is something that is uh, very, very much uh, front and center. I will add with one last note, this is quite important. After Cambridge Analytica, many organizations like the Atlanta Council and others developed state-of-the-art research groups to track disinformation in inauthentic behavior, especially from foreign sources. 
in 2020, these public research groups and platforms worked closely with the federal government sharing information to prevent election interference. Sadly, some members of Congress took offense uh, uh, regarding that work, claiming the institutions were biased against conservative voices. Oversight committee subpoenaed them to produce major data dumps uh, of their correspondence, calls, et cetera. Some parts of the federal government actually were enjoined uh, through the courts from communicating with research groups. And that case is still pending. Universities that had research contracts with the Biden administration pulled back from those activities uh, that were within this scope. And as a result, the government uh, research community platform cooperation that had worked so effectively in 2020, really important work to protect integrity of elections is really largely gone. Terrific. Um, Susan, thanks so much. Jessica, I want to come to you just really quickly, 60 second uh, reaction to the overlap differences between the EU experience and the, the UK experience. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. I, I really appreciate all your comments and particularly for calling out the researcher access to data issue. Um, I, I would say that Ofcom is very supportive of this, but how uh, lawmaking works in the UK is it makes it a little bit out of our hands at the moment. So the UK Parliament um, are the ones that draft and produce the laws and then Ofcom is tasked with implementing them. So we remain supportive and we're uh, uh, you know, following very actively the developments that are happening in parliament today and conversations happening across government. But in the meantime, assuming that there are no changes, uh, what we will be doing is putting together a report within a year that sort of summarizes and looks at the state of uh, researcher access to data in the UK. Fantastic. David, we heard a lot about public-private partnerships, and this is your bread and butter. Over to you uh, for some expansion on that thought. Thanks, Blake. Um, so um, uh, I run an organization called the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. Uh, we are an industry partnership that brings together sort of diverse uh, providers of different digital products and services um, from Apple to Zoom. Uh, so different business models, different services, um, aligning around a set of best practices uh, for trust and safety. Uh, and we're uh, building out, I think, practices, um, standards, assessment methodologies um, that hopefully can bring some rigor. Um, our approach here is, I think, to be uh, descriptive, um, to rather than start with the normative questions about what should be done about these things, is to say, what are the practitioners inside companies doing, and can we organize um, what's being done uh, conceptually in a way that I think will help here? Uh, and so that's how I'm going to kind of frame frame my remarks about yeah uh, public private partnerships, um, recognizing the challenges that Susan just uh, mentioned, uh, as well as that we'll get to with Matt. <laughs> um, so I think more than public private partnerships, it's like what are the uh, things that the private sector can do, that the private sector can do together with civil society, um, with academia, uh, with like-minded, you know, sort of uh, folks who share certain values, looking at the, the threats we have both to individuals and to society uh, that Danielle and others have laid out here. Um, uh, there's a great report on disinformation just came out last week from the Carnegie Endowment for uh, International Peace on sort of uh, a... Um, uh, evidence-based evaluation of uh, approaches to disinformation um, by uh, John Bateman and Dean Jackson. Um, I really encourage folks to take a look at it. There, they looked at 10 different kind of option, policy options for disinformation, ranging from supporting local journalism uh, all the way to sort of looking at tweaking algorithmic recommendation systems. Uh, their conclusion is that there's really no silver bullet here, uh, that none of the intervention, interventions that they looked at sort of were both well studied, um, known to be effective, uh, and easy to scale. Uh, and so what they recommended is that uh, democracies, uh, and, and I think we can say policymakers, whether it's in government or outside of government, um, need to adopt a portfolio approach. Um, to manage uncertainty, sort of acting like investors and trying to have a diversified mix of efforts to fight disinformation. Um, so um, my view here is that uh, the best way of thinking about how we can develop that portfolio and how I'll, I'll frame my observations here is to organize our thoughts. And I'm gonna um, self-promotionally 
push the framework that my organization has uh, developed, which has five overarching commitments, which reflect, I think, how practitioners inside companies working on trust and safety think about their work. Uh, and those five commitments are around product development and sort of the safety by design piece of what goes in um, to the products uh, and features um, that are part of digital services. Um, governance, uh, sort of what are the rules um, for how a service should operate? Uh, are those rules clearly uh, explained uh, and are they updated with the right kind of input from outside experts? Um, enforcement of that governance in an effective way improvement over time, a sort of process of continuous improvement, um, and transparency, um, not just transparency reporting, um, but a whole range of different types of transparency measures. Um, so we've got about 35 specific examples of best practices that companies are using. Um, we're looking to turn those best practices into international standards um, that could perhaps set some sort of common approach um, domestically, internationally, uh, in terms of kind of the reasonable steps you should expect responsible companies to be taking here. Um, so I just wanted to, I think, uh, offer a few portfolio recommendations um, across those five commitments um, that are examples of the kinds of things that companies and NGOs and academics and governments are doing um, that I think are all pieces, not, there's no silver bullet, but these are all pieces of the puzzle that in aggregate maybe it can help us move the dial here. Um, so uh, on the product development side, um, one of our practices is evaluating the trust and safety considerations of product features, um, balancing sort of the usability of, of, of features with their ability to resist abuse. Um, and here I wanna point to um, a totally separate initiative uh, that, um, uh, I think is really interesting is the, the work to develop uh, technical standards around provenance. Uh, there's something called the Content Authenticity Initiative. Um, it's being led by Adobe, but also involves everyone from the New York Times to the uh, human rights NGO Witness, um, developing technical standards um, and really the metadata to track, you know, from when a picture is taken, um, what happens to that picture to sort of demonstrate the provenance and to sort of fight disinformation um, from that side of things. Um, uh, on governance, um, so um, folks may have seen today uh, actually a new announcement from the, uh, the Facebook oversight board um, uh, on the uh, decision, the case they were considering around altered video of um, President Biden. Uh, um, they uh, upheld the decision that Facebook made not to um, remove this video because it did not uh, go against uh, Facebook's stated policies about uh, sort of manipulated media, um, but also urged um, Meta to uh, reconsider those policies and to address um, sort of some of the specific gaps that this particular case recognized. So I think that's just kind of an example of how getting more precise, really thinking about specific harms and how those can be addressed through content policies is a constantly evolving and sort of um, a, a, an issue that needs just to be um, constant attention. Um, quickly, uh, on enforcement, um, one of our practices is working with uh, third parties, um, such as fact checkers or human rights groups, to identify meaningful enforcement responses. Um, here I want to point to a uh, non-governmental effort from the UK, um, uh, stopncii.org, um, which is a kind of hash sharing program, um, working with a bunch of companies um, to, to prevent the distribution of um, non-consensual intimate imagery um, through hash sharing. Um, uh, I think those are the kind of really creative collaborations between NGOs and, and industry um, that, that make a meaningful difference here. Um, on improvement, uh, again, one of our practices is using risk assessments. Uh, and here, um, I, I wanted to just highlight some work that we've, I've had the pleasure of co-chairing a World Economic Forum uh, Global Coalition for Digital Safety together with colleagues from Ofcom, uh, with Susan uh, in, in, very involved in that among a whole bunch of other folks across um, different stakeholder groups. Um, we've developed some resources there, a, a risk assessment framework, um, a typology of harms, a set of case studies, uh, and I think I've been encouraged by the extent to which in that group, we've been able to bring together the perspectives of companies, um, of regulators, including the UK and Australia okay. and, and others, along with human rights groups and NGOs, um, to learn from what's already been done and not try to reinvent the wheel when it comes to these processes. Uh, and then um, lastly, uh, on uh, transparency, uh, 
Um, so uh, one of our practices is working with researchers um, to the point of not just about data access, but broader, broader efforts there. Uh, and there I wanna highlight something that is independent of kind of legislation and regulation, um, but the development of an academic uh, sort of study of trust and safety. Uh, and in particular, um, out of Stanford, the Journal of Online Trust and Safety um, is a really, uh, I think, powerful and unique um, uh, uh, academic institution that is publishing um, peer-reviewed research. And so just in the past year, there's been a couple of, of peer-reviewed articles, one studying deep fake communities and sort of what's happened as those uh, deep fake communities were sort of deplatformed from the major platforms and what's happening there. Uh, and then another, another looking at some of the, you know, kind of um, uh, potentially counterproductive aspects of informing people about deep fakes uh, and how that can sort of lead to people, the liar's dividend sort of point in, in terms of people sort of dismissing anything as a deep fake. Um, so um, those are few portfolio recommendations in terms of some of the things that are going on right now and that maybe some of those things can continue to evolve and persist in the face of the very real challenges that I think we'll turn to next. All right, we started on a very dour note. I'm feeling uplifted. I feel like we have <laughs> solved it. Matt, burn it all down. Yeah, I, I know you're counting on me to be the buzzkill, but I actually feel uh, optimistic about Jessica's presentation. But I'll try my best to uh, have a negative frame on it. Um, <laughs> thank you. But first, a, a couple of thank yous. Um, uh, first of all, Blake, to you for organizing the event, um, and then also to Brad for coordinate, uh, coordinating uh, the last couple of days. I mean, it, this is just really such an extraordinary community. I guess there are sort of three things maybe that I'd highlight. Um, one is how many people seem to feel such pride in having affiliation with um, Silicon Flatirons. It's really an incredible thing. I think there probably is some metric of organiz organizational health um, that's rooted in how proud people are to talk about their association with an organization. And you can just see that over the last couple of days, um, including the relationship that people have with people who have a deep relationship with this place. Um, I don't know Professor Hatfield. I don't know um, Attorney General Weiser. I feel like if in five minutes people are like, we're going to toast them, I feel like I could get in line and offer my own <laughs> toast based on just hearing the last couple of days um, all the um, extraordinary contributions that they've made to this community. Um, I also think, I'm not sure I've ever been to an academic event where there are so many people who have come in from the broader community. I've met a number of people who are practicing law in Denver, practicing law in Boulder, um, and who know of events here and enjoy coming to them and wanted to come and participate. That's not a typical thing, I don't think, um, and it's really striking that you've created that here. And then finally, just infused throughout the last couple of days are the affection and admiration you have for your students, which again, I think everyone in the university atmosphere professes to have that, but you are practicing it in a way that feels different to me. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank Christine, who's an extraordinary ambassador um, for this organization, for the people who are outside it and excited about coming to events like this. Thank you so much for the work that you did to make it possible to, um, to participate. Um, okay, so I'll start with admiration things and then I'll try my best to sort of burn it down, I guess. <laughs> light, light a small fire, I guess. Um, I mean, first of all, I have a tremendous admi <laughs> um, First of all, I, 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 mean, I think you can hear from Jessica's presentation the level of expertise that she brings to these questions and how um, impressive she is individually and what that means to the organization that she's involved in in terms of trying to set thoughtful, um, innovative policy in the space, despite the incredible challenges um, that there are in doing that. Um, a three, thing, uh, three things I think that we can learn positively from the UK, um, one, and these are the things that uh, I think others have highlighted as well. One, it's cooperative nature. Um, in the United States, we talk about accountability. We like to file lawsuits. I think the approach in, in the UK is one that allows companies to come toward the government and the government to come toward companies, probably in ways that if we had empirical analysis of it would suggest that there's actually more progress, I would think, made in that approach than through the more uh, litigious approach that we have here. Um, Second, this is something, again, that, that lots of people have highlighted, the, the ongoing evaluation that's built into the system um, that we get, I think, through transparency. And that leads us to a final component that I think is really admirable, which is that um, the, the norms and codes are not static, they're iterative. And that means that because we have ongoing evaluation, we can learn over time about what works and what doesn't. In the United States, we pass a law and we hope for the best and we rarely repeal them. Um, in the UK, this approach is an iterative one where it can build over time and learn from its successes and its failures. Um, a few things in my light fire. Um, 
Uh, one is I don't think 1700 pages is workable for most companies. That works for companies like Meta and Google where you have tens of thousands of attorneys who can read through all those pages. It doesn't work for companies that might not have any public policy team, might have one general counsel and no other members of their legal team. They're not able to read through that kind of, they're not, they're not able to read through um, rules uh, at that volume. And then I think the second thing, which is maybe equally Im important, companies like Meta and Google can not just read the rules, but then they can go and shape them. They have the teams to digest them and then go and engage with the government. A smaller company that's not even able to wade through the compliance regime is going to, I think, have limited ability to go out and influence it. Um, second component, this is like a sm small thing, but maybe a big thing. Um, I don't understand why we just talk about impact assessments. So we talk about them in the human rights space, human rights impact assessments. We talk about them in the privacy space with privacy impact assessments. We're talking about them here. That only evaluates one component of the equation. It just measures costs. And as we know, there are things that are high cost, but also welfare enhancing because the benefits outweigh the costs. And so I think in this area, as with many others, we need to tilt more toward cost benefit analyses where we're actually weighing two sides of an equation and not just looking at harms, but also looking at welfare enhancing gains from various different technologies so that we can evaluate whether deployment makes sense. If all we do is, quantitate, is, is, is quantify the downsides, then the, the direction of travel is to, um, is to not deploy things that could be valuable if we actually measured the value. Um, the third thing, which Blake, this is your expertise really and not mine, I think this is what you wanted me to get at, is First Amendment concerns with, the, with these issues. And um, we have seen First Amendment create headwinds in the United States for various different things that states have done to try to address child safety concerns. Um, there have been lawsuits filed in California, Arkansas, and Ohio that have stopped those laws in their tracks. And I think the core component, which um, I don't fully understand why we're not doing a better job, maybe that's not fair. Um, it seems like there could be more foresight about First Amendment challenges coming down the road. And most of these laws are content-based and that means they're gonna face strict scrutiny challenges. We know the strict scrutiny test. We might wish the law were different. Attorney General Weiser yesterday was talking about First Amendment Lochnerism. Maybe current First Amendment jurisprudence isn't the right jurisprudence. But in courtrooms, typically that's the jurisprudence that's applied. So we know the evaluation that's coming and therefore we need to develop laws that are gonna meet typically strict scrutiny analysis. And I think for good reason, many of these laws have been struck down. Maybe we want there to be child safety laws that survive, but I think they're gonna to have to be more disciplined in order, to, um, in order to get them through. I do think maybe this is my like um, slightly optimistic note to conclude on. Um, one way, one vehicle for su surviving strict scrutiny analysis, I think are communities like this one, research communities that can actually develop the research that closes the gap between a governmental interest and the provisions of law that are, that are intended to be narrowly tailored to meet that interest. There are things I think that we're very flimsy about actually that I don't quite understand. So I have like an ethical commitment now I think to say this, which is the empirical literature on misinformation suggests fairly conclusively that misinformation has very little persuasive effect. That is known very widely in the academic community. And yet typically we go to events where people just assume that, the, that X's policy on misinformation is going to play a really important role in Trump versus Biden. And maybe it will, maybe the research is wrong, maybe we learn new things that suggest that the existing research is wrong, but existing empirical literature suggests that X's policy is not gonna be particularly impactful. If we pass laws based on that assumption, they will be struck down in court because judges will look at the empirical research and say that they are not well-founded. So I do think that research smart, thoughtful research and some of the open questions that we have has the possibility to enable states and policymakers to survive these challenges. Well, thanks so much, Matt. And what a rich set of conversations. And I, we're almost at the time where I've got to open it up uh, to questions. And I, I see my four students have made the mistake of all sitting together, um, <laughs> which means they are just ripe for, for, for cold calling. Um, but before I do that, um, Danielle, I wonder if I could come back to you for a very quick closing uh, reaction. We had some real optimistic notes here. How do you feel about the world that, that has been, uh, been painted for us? You know, I've seen a lot. Of, so I've worked with companies since 2009. So starting with Twitter, when there was one person dressed in safety, Dell oh, Harvey, so. and, uh, and Facebook, of course. And, and Stop NCII comes out of the work that CCRI Cyber Civil Rights Initiative did uh, with Facebook, along with our partner uh, at CCRI, Hani Fareed, um, to have hash images. So those are so encouraging. And having other companies, so this is a little encouragement, right? Like 
having um, companies join that effort as they did last summer is, is so encouraging. Um, that is, that is um, not central intimate imagery that has been so adjudicated as such by the company and verified so, so that we're not talking about any nudity, which I'm all for nudity. This is non-consensual, right, explicit, uh, you know, intimate information. And I guess, um, so that is encouraging. Uh, I think, Matt, we're going to not agree on much, but I think, Matt, you're right about the, those 17,000 million pages. Yeah, that, that can't work. And I think, um, you know, that's why some of the work that I've been doing on Section 230 reform is very targeted and very narrow. And we've got to be if we're going to have reform that works. And that runs through the crystal of strict scrutiny. Um, and we've seen laws that we've worked on uh, get through that crucible. You know, five of the laws that went up to the state's highest courts on laws that we worked on criminalizing intimate privacy violations. And I'm not crazy about the criminal law, but nonetheless, all five, all state's highest courts upheld them, ran them through the crucible of strict scrutiny and said they were narrowly tailored and it was a compelling government interest and written with enough care. Um, I wish that, you know, lawmakers would always listen to Dr. Marianne Franks. They don't always, right? Um, so I think, I think we need to do... I think the idea that we say the First Amendment, we throw up our hands. Um, Section 230 isn't the First Amendment, right? We we can and must do better. We act like it's still what the commissioner was saying. We act like it's that era. We just say, shut your computer down. This is like a lawless zone. It was never lawless. And we omit, I think, Matt, I'm going to disagree with you on the, I guess maybe in the UK, they're, they're way into the, you know, they're, they're only seeing the costs and not the benefits. Here, there is so much harm that is externalized, in which there are no lawsuits. Section 230, there are no lawsuits. So you can't sue the deep pocket. And because you can't get pro bono counsel, unlike Carrie Goldberg, who can bring like five pro bono cases a year, we cannot sue. There is no one to sue. There is no intermediary. So I think, yes, in the United States, common law could, development could do quite a bit, but has been hamstrung by Section 230, by the enabler, right? And we need a tort. Negligent enablement of crime is a real tort that we could so proceed with if we didn't have Section 230. It's not strict liability. That is the reforms initiatives that I've been talking about. But nonetheless, we live in the land of no liability. So, you know, with, with that, um, I don't think it's all depressing. I think we have seen, right, really important um, civil society groups, just as David underscored, right, with, um, you know, with companies and made really considerable progress. Uh, I worry about, Susan, when you were noting the, and highlighting the supervisory role, like we're going to see, and this, Blake, you know so much about the job owning decision, which I think could go off the rails. Like there's a way in which the coercion, I worry the Supreme Court may not get this right, and that companies, that governments will be like, we say nothing, right? That A.G. Harris, that convening that she did back in 2015 couldn't happen now. So I'm, I'm a little worried. <laughs> We have a number of great threads to tee up in the Q&A. And as always, um, by the wiser rule, uh, the first, oh, you guys are all raising your hands. Nice. Um, why don't we go, I, I see Catherine Ferry, who is my, my TA for telecom law. She's a ringer. You cannot hire her uh, this upcoming year. She has already got a job. Uh, Catherine, over to you. Uh, hi, yes. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I have a question for Professor Citrone, um, you spoke a little bit about Section 230 reform, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what exactly about 230 you would reform. Um, I, because I don't see a path to combating this through the Supreme Court with Stevens and, like you said, their attitude and countermen. So 230 is really all that I see, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what exactly you would change. Thank you. Soon, Representative Jake Auchincloss is going to be dropping a bill that, that I help work on. It's based on my article called How to Fix Section 230. Talk about clear title. At least I tried. Um, <laughs> you know, I think first things first, where we know we have civil rights and civil liberties costs is with intimate privacy violations, cyber stalking, and defamatory deep fakes involving intimate imagery. Like those are clear. The research is clear. The cost, the, the human wreckage, right? And so what one part of the reform would be to say, if you encourage deliberately and knowingly encourage or solicit intimate privacy violations defined very narrowly as to non-consensual intimate imagery and faked intimate imagery, as well as cyber stalking content defined very clearly, right, 
those folks just don't enjoy the legal shield. That's not to say they're strictly liable. They're just like, they don't get the shield, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna be the worst Samaritan ever, right? And then um, for every other platform with regard to intimate privacy violations, cyber stalking, again, like defined as clearly as we can and have, um, that you've gotta take five reasonable steps drawing from the work that I've done in trust and safety and all that work that folks in trust and safety have done. It will seem like low hanging fruit, I think to David, that is it's, we prescribe those five, five steps because as I work with all my colleagues at University of Virginia, my colleague Ken Abraham's like, reasonable steps is too vague. You must prescribe them. Do you know them? I was like, I got them. You know, haven't worked with companies for this long. He's like, put them in the statute. So I did. <laughs> uh, so, so David, they may not be as detailed. That is, they're not smushy. They're rules, right? But at the very least, I'll take low hanging fruit over nothing in exchange for the immunity shield. So I hope that helps. And it came out in BU Law Review in May. So I'm happy to send it to you too, the piece. It's out. Let's go to David and then to Matt. Oh, I think our Matt, Matt yeah, first. So I, know, I know it's bad panel practice to aim for agreement as opposed to disagreement, but I actually think the gap between, um, be between us is actually so somewhat narrower in that I, I think it's possible that you get to the outcome that you want in at least some cases under existing 230 law. So the, the liability shield does not apply if you create or develop content in whole or in part. So developing, the idea of developing content in part is actually like but something courts that I think- have not, Matt, courts have not gone there. Right, right. but I think the question, I, I think- With a few exceptions, like yeah, the but Seventh I, Circuit's Salesforce decision. But yeah, but- rare. Right, it, it, it's and rare, but it does, really it, does, it does seem in, in some of the cases that you're, that you're describing that there's a pretty strong argument but you're not developing. encouraging or soliciting the back page case literally like could not have been more encouraging or so there's criminal liability in the back page case federal right? criminal liability have we yeah. seen one suit not at all literally not in my 20 years doing that. but that's not a 230 issue though. i Can know I, but right, let, let me let me intervene with a, 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 a question uh, here See, we and totally disagree i i, so I just want to i, I want to pull so, us so, maybe so actually, to a point a point of agreement here from yesterday's conversation which is we've actually not seen a lot of 230 cases about generative ai does generative AI yeah. present a different two thirty? I, I was going to say, I, I, I think, I mean, there are, people, there are a lot of people on a, a range of different views on this question. The specific facts, I think, are very important here. But do generative AI tools typically develop content, at least in part? It seems like the answer in lots of cases would be yes. And certainly, I think, for the most interesting, expansive product boundary pushing uses of the technology, the answer probably is yes. M my hope would be that there'd be like jurisprudence that would develop here that would that would give more teeth to develop content in part. I think you're under the, like, passing a law in Congress is unlikely to happen. And so um, pinning all our hopes and dreams on 230 reform, I think is like an unlikely prospect. I think. I'm not pinning it all, read my book. It's like, I got, I got, law is such a blunt tool. There's no question about it. But if we give up on the project of law, right? Law is expressive, it is our teacher, sure. right? It is how we, form norms of, of what is wrong, what's on the table and off the table. So I'm not giving up on long. I got a whole, I got four chapters on what else we can <laughs> sure, do. Sure, but if we, if we can get more teeth to develop content in part, I do think that does some work. It doesn't get you there, I don't think, but it does work that I think is like instrumental and meaningful. All right, we are gonna to go to the uh, corollary to the Wiser Rule developed last year, uh, which is the Senator Bennett Rule, which is we will keep calling on students as long as there are student <laughs> questions. And I see uh, Halef uh, made the mistake of uh, raising his hand in solidarity. So Halef, over to you. Um, hi, um, thank you all for being here and for this lively discussion. My question is more about, so, you know, we are right now talking about the EU's approach, you know, with DSA and Ofcom in the UK uh, and in the US, but some of the harms that we have been talking about are like they, they cross physical boundaries of, of, of these countries, right? Like just because the UK, let's say, manages to solve some of these issues doesn't mean that a person who was targeted, a woman likely, right? Like we're talking about the fakes in the UK is going to have the protections, the same protections in the US, you know, in Africa, in Asia, wherever they are, that may be. So what is, uh, how, how do we go about, I guess, solving that problem? How do we bring 
those you know different regions of the world kind of together on on some common ground whereby the victims are actually afforded proper protection so let me go to david first and then jessica I'd invite you to uh, respond if, if you have thoughts on that as well yeah i think on that it's it's incredibly important because we, we need to have people who are using these technologies like everywhere around the world involved in and sort of affected by how we govern them. Uh, and yeah, many countries around the world will not have uh, the wherewithal to hire 350 people uh, to work on the kind of online safety uh, act that the UK has. As somebody who's working on a response to their consultation right now, <laughs> I can definitely attest to just how much work that is. This is why I think international standards um, uh, offer a sort of point of convergence and why the work of the Global Online Safety Regulators Network is also really important here. Um, they've added um, uh, to that network uh, uh, folks from South Africa, uh, from Korea, from Fiji. Uh, and uh, so I think um, international standards that provide a baseline that regulators can point to uh, and perhaps some um, methods, common methods of sort of management systems and assessments that might be a little bit lighter touch than, you know, uh, say the UK is proposing, but which still offers sort of commonality. Jessica, over to you. Thank you. And it, you're absolutely right to, to raise this question. It's so important. And I think this is really the motivation, uh, one of the many motivations for why we've invested so much in our international coordination with other regulators. Our, our jurisdiction does stop at UK borders, but I do think that we have an opportunity here as you know, someone who's worked in some of these platforms, I can tell you from firsthand experience, it's very difficult to put in place specific measures that are only uh, applicable in one country and not globally. And when you look at the range of proposals we're recommending in our, in our um, first consultation, they're really enormous. They're, you know, we're talking about systems, operations. Um, we're looking at things like user reporting systems or content moderation systems. So they're not necessarily ones that a company would have isolated in the UK. And our hope really is that even if um, companies are doing it for UK legislation, it will become more costly for them to, to do bespoke uh, tailored uh, interventions just for our law. And that's really why we're looking at the DSA. We're looking at what Australia is doing. And we're trying to ensure that whatever we're recommending is as aligned as it can be with these other regulators. So when platforms are thinking about how to comply, they should be able to do so in a way that's sort of internationally coherent and at scale. Susan, did you want to jump in? Sure, just to endorse the notion, and that's kind of what modularity is, once again, uh, where you can get that commonality, those pipes uh, working together, even though you have very different uh, regulatory regimes. Uh, I would also just make a comment uh, that um, a lot of the uh, platforms that are smaller platforms that are not in scope in these laws are the ones uh, that uh, are the most problematic. That's right. Small is not valuable. Mr. Deepfakes, one person in a basement externalized a tremendous amount of harm. All right, I've not gotten the hook yet. I think we have time for one more question and why don't we come down here in the front? Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to really quickly reiterate Matt's point. Uh, I'm a guest uh, at this conference and I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, specifically, I'm a University of North Carolina graduate, so it's glad to see another another <laughs> member here <laughs> representing for you. Pro propaganda and disinformation. <laughs> I know. Now, can I can I still can I still ask my question? Uh, <laughs> um, but no, I really, really appreciate the debate uh, on the stage. It reminds me of a lot of my classes reading through, you know, how do we regulate the, whether it's like code is law or reading the cult of the Constitution. So really, really happy Very to be here. Fact, yeah. <laughs> in, um, in this room. So, I mean, we talked a little bit about how to skin this cat of misinformation, disinformation, and deep fakes. And I actually came to the previous uh, session on copyright um, in AI. Uh, and that was one thing that I was really interested in because I think that's been a band-aid specifically for regulating deep fakes. Um, but when it, become, when it comes to copyright in AI, there's this question of whether or not these images are transformative. And so do you foresee that? I mean, Matt, maybe you can ruin whether copyright law is a good way to regulate but or, or anyone on the panel 
<laughs> All right, I'll put on my, my copyright professor hat uh, just for a second and say um, it's a fantastic question. I think there is real tension, um, and Mark Lemley has, has got a paper uh, discussing this, um, between the kinds of arguments that platforms are going to be making uh, to claim Section 230 eligibility for generative AI, um, which sort of involves saying, like, this is uh, all, all the outputs are just what our, uh, our, our users are putting out in the world. It's Mr. Deepfake's uh, content. Uh, we, what can we possibly do about that? And in fair use, which, by the way, I think there was some dismissal yesterday of the notion that copyright is important. We're talking about 150K statutory damages times millions or billions of works. There's no company that's not bet the company liability for. And the fair use case depends on being able to say exactly, um, as you point out, uh, that actually the most important thing here is the transformation that's happening. It's what we are doing. Um, so that's not to say that the needle can't be thread, but there is real tension uh, between those. And so I think that's a really interesting uh, connection from this conference to the last one. So thank you for that question. With that, let me thank our panelists, and in particular, uh, Jessica, for uh, joining us very very late uh, London time. Um, I, I don't know if it's too late for a, a cup of tea, but we will uh, we'll let you go. Um, I think we have tea and also coffee and refreshments in the next room. We'll be back in about 15 minutes for our closing keynote from Senator Hickenlooper. Thanks very much. Thank